morning, everybody. Thank you for joining the ACA Small Business Boot Camp and Resource Collective uh, for this Tuesday morning, August, August October 13th. Um, uh, we're excited to have everybody here. We've got a great session planned for you today. We're all excited about that. Uh, to start, I wanted to go through and thank all our community partners. Uh, again, we cannot do these sessions without their help, expertise, and the content they've created. Uh, we are extremely grateful for their participation. As many of you already know, the ACA Small Business Boot Camp and Resource Collective is designed to help small businesses uh, work through the COVID crisis and return stronger than ever. It is a statewide initiative supported by all of our community partners uh, throughout the throughout state from all corners. And the boot camp is going to continue on through December and into the new year, uh, including the Resource Collective. So the Small Business Boot Camp website contains a lot of information. One, it's the same place we registered to, to sign up for the session. And it is also the location where all the previous sessions are archived. Today is the 88th session, I believe. And all the previous sessions have been recorded and are available in the archive on this website. Additionally, on the website, you'll find our resource collected. And this is a gathering of the resources and tools that are provided by our community partners. And you can access them and use them uh, to help you with your business. This is just a sample list of some of the guides and resources available on the Resource Collective. Um, you can see there's things from insurance to construction, salons, restaurants, uh, safe workplace, etc. cetera. It's a lot of great uh, information that can be found in the Resource Collective. So this week we've got uh, two great sessions, Fine Tuning Your Business, plan with uh, Lou Farina from the Maricopa Small Business Development Center. And then on Thursday, we have Bookkeeping 101, What Every Business Owner Needs to Know uh, by Lisa Card from the Mojave uh, Community College Small Business Development Center from Kingman. So we're excited about uh, both these sessions. They're both excellent professionals and uh, have a lot of experience uh, they'll be able to share with everybody. So there were some real quick updates. Uh, later today is our Empowering Rural Communities webinar. Uh, you can sign up for that uh, on the link listed here on the, this page. Additionally, if you're still looking for an economic injury disaster loan, um, that program is still active and you can get more information or apply for it on the SBA's website, sba.gov. Um, additionally, some updates from the SBA, um, I add the link here for the PPP Loan Forgiveness FAQ um, on the SBA's website. And the new thing that was announced later in the day after our PPP uh, Forgiveness update that we did last week is the SBA created a new streamlined PPP Loan Forgiveness application for loans under $50,000. Um, this is a link to the article and the article also uh, has links to the forgiveness application and the instructions for it, but it's a very simple, streamlined, you know, page, page and a half document that makes it much easier for those smaller loans to apply for forgiveness. Um, just a quick reminder for the state's COVID-19 information and resources at ArizonaTogether.org. And then a quick reminder of our website uh, for Arizona Business Resources. There's a lot of great resources on this page on azcommerce.com forward slash COVID-19. Um, it's a, you can find many different resources, financial resources, business guidance, et cetera. So uh, we keep it updated often as well. So just some of the ACA programs that are available um, for small businesses. We have our small business services, um, and I'm over that. I, I forgot to introduce myself for those that don't know me. I'm Robert Theobald, the Small Business Ombudsman and Vice President of Small Business Services. And we can help with navigating through the SBA, working with the SBDC, working with local banking contacts, uh, and many other connections that we can provide for you. Our workforce division also can help with small businesses looking to hire employees or upskill their current uh, workforce. And then our Arizona MVP can work with the small and medium-sized manufacturers to help them grow and, and reach their potential and goals. Additionally, during this time, a lot of people are looking at starting side gigs or starting new businesses. 
And our small business checklist is a great interactive online resource to help business owners or potential business owners understand the, the starting process, the licensing, registration, and compliance processes for getting the business started in Arizona. So today we have Lou Farina. Um, he's a business analyst for the Maricopa SBDC with a tremendous background uh, in a tech. And so we are excited to have him here uh, with us today. I, I talked to Lou quite a bit at various events throughout the Valley and uh, we're excited to have him with us. So Lou, I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to you and let you get started. Okay. Uh, thank you, Robert. I appreciate it. Let me um, share my um, slides. Okay. And hang on, hang on, let's share. I think you need to give me, I think you, you're still sharing, Bob, so it won't let me share. Uh, there, there should be go. a little blue button in the corner. If you need the green share button. Okay, gotcha. All right, hang on. Share screen two. Okay, hang on. Okay, yep, how's yep. that? Looks good. Good? Yep. All good? Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, well, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for attending. Um, again, my name is Lou Farina. I'm a business advisor with the uh, SBDC, Small Business Development Center. Um, your, uh, the workshop today is uh, The Business Plan is Alive and Well, also known as Fine Tuning Your Business Plan. And we're going to spend uh, the next hour or so talking about a business plan, why it's important, um, how to use it, and um, some other things. So first, just a little bit about the SBDC, I, um, Small Business Development Center. So we are a community resource and we are no fee service and we can partner with our clients to provide you um, assistance in growing your business. So we really can, uh, you know, can engage at any part, uh, pre-venture to, to startups all the way to, you know, growing and, and even exiting your business. Um, we have individual counselors that do one-on-one -on -one counseling services. Um, what makes us no fee is it's prepaid. It's prepaid by your tax dollars. Uh, we're funded by the SBA at the federal at the federal level and at the state level. We're funded by the Maricopa Community College District, as well as the Arizona uh, Commerce Authority. So um, again, just a little bit about my background. Um, I uh, spent most of my um, time in the private sector, Fortune 100 companies, commercializing different technologies around the globe. Um, when I left there, I decided I wanted to focus on the local economy. Um, so I, uh, I started um, with an angel investing group, also did consulting for AS, uh, ASU, for Thunderbird. And um, I'm here at the, S at the SBDC today, um, enjoying my ability to reach and help assist um, many of the uh, tech startups and technology um, companies here in the, in the local economy. So this is what our, our session is going to look like this morning. Um, we're going to start with just a little bit about what a business plan is. Um, and then I'm going to try, kind of, um, try to convince you that um, it's a good idea to write a business plan. And uh, then we'll talk about some of the key elements of a good business plan. And finally, we'll end with some resources to assist you if you are um, engaging in writing a business plan. <clears throat> so I start with uh, a comic here, you know. And it says, Harv, Harv, you know, sometimes when it comes to business plans, simplicity is the best. And uh, there's uh, somebody who's, you know, at his boss's desk and he's got these piles of paper. So um, simplicity is important. And I'm going to just tell you a little story here. And this, this was me probably, oh, 30 years ago or so. Um, I walked into uh, vice president's office. I was pitching him a uh, business, a uh, business opportunity. And uh I had my 50 page plan and my 30 page deck and I got up and I started talking and he, st he just stopped me and he looked at me and he said, 
Lou applesauce. And I said, looked up and I said, Ricky, um, the cafeteria is closed and I really have no idea what you're talking about. He said, and he laughed and we had a good laugh. And I was real young and he was mentoring me at that point. And he just said, look, Lou, what do you think I do all day? I sit here at my desk. People come across my desk. I make decisions. They provide information. They provide lots of information. So all I do is really look at information and make decisions all day. He said, and so, you know, with regard to apples, I can't pick the apples. I can't slice the apples. I can't peel them. When you come in here, you got to bring me applesauce. And what he was telling me is keep it simple, make it digestible, make it easy on your audience. So if we touch talk uh, just from an academic, I guess, perspective, you know, what is business planning? The act of business planning um, encompasses the goals, strategies, and actions that you envision to take to ensure your businesses start your starts and grows. So um, that's nice. Those are nice words, but really what do they mean? And I'm more visual. So, you know, I, uh, I look at a business plan as a, <clears throat> as a blueprint. It's a blueprint for your business. So anybody who's built anything, <clears throat> and let's take a house, for example, um, you wouldn't start construction or you could, but you wouldn't do it judiciously if you did it without a set of plans. So um, uh, um, uh, the business plan is really kind of the blueprint of your business. It is, it's, it helps you organize your thoughts. It helps you start foundationally um, and build from the bottom up. <clears throat> so a lot of you probably came in here a little skeptical because you've heard some of the things that I've heard and you said, wait, wait, Lou, stop. I heard the business plan is dead. And, you know, um, I've heard people say that. And I was just at a conference where folks were talking about the, that, that it's not needed anymore. As a matter of fact, if you went onto Amazon, you could find a book with the title, The Business Plan is Dead. And um, if you, you probably have read, um, and everybody has a story that they've read that there's a startup that raised millions of dollars in capital with only a few presentation slides. And, uh, you know, that does happen. I will tell you that does happen. But that really is reserved for some of the uh, select few folks who have raised um, capital before and exited um, with, you know, hundreds of million dollars of value on the other side. So you do that two or three times, you get a little bit of credibility and maybe you don't need to provide some of the documentation that the rest of us will need if we're looking for, um, if we're looking for funding or, in, or credibility. But on the other hand, um, a business plan in the form of a 50 page strategy document, like the one that I brought into my boss 30 years ago, that takes a couple years to write and sits on your computer is certainly dead and a waste of time. And that's not what's done. And that's not how we do it today. But, you know, the, the takeaway is the business plan really isn't dead. It's, it is an evolving, um, it really is an evolving concept. So, uh, this is a slide I like to use in some of my other workshops, but on the jockey, not the horse. So um, some of the folks probably in, in the audience um, have heard this. And what this means is people bet on people. Okay, so um, in, in this analogy, the horse is the venture or the idea and the jockey is the management or you as the entrepreneur. And so um, when, when people are evaluating, evaluating you from, a, um, from either a partnership or a resource provisional perspective, um, they are looking at you um, and, and your ability to, um, to provide the information that's necessary for them to engage with you efficiently is really important. And, and you know, so it comes down to, will you write a business plan? Can you write a business plan? And, um, and, and so, um, it, that's, it, they become important, important um, facets when you're looking at the management team. Um, okay, so I don't know if, if we're all together, I guess maybe you'd be laughing, but um, this is a, a picture of, uh, um, this is an old Star Trek episode. And I don't know if anybody's heard of the Vulcan mind meld. Well, this is the way that um, I guess Vulcans could, could read your mind, right? And so, as a stakeholder on the other side, somebody sits on the other side of the table from the of business plans. Um, this is kind of what it feels like sometimes trying to extract information out of somebody. And I will tell you, there's a, there's a rule. It's at least three to one efficient. So if you took, if it took 40 hours to write a business plan, which is not 
you know, not unheard of. It would take somebody really 120 hours to extract it in a, in a verbal setting, um, in a meeting, orally. And that would include questioning, note-taking, organization on the, on the stakeholders part. So um, it's probably even um, much more efficient than three to one. So here, the takeaway here is it's very, no one is gonna put the time in to extract from you orally what you could do if you wrote it down. It's much more efficient if you write it down as a starting point to be able to share your information. Um, there's, there's things about the written word that are just, um, it's why we write things down, it's efficient. Um, there's an element of accuracy, there's credibility. Again, can you write, can you write? How do you write? And then, you know, what's not listed here is storage, right? You can store the written word. I can go back, I can reference it. So writing um, is important, it's efficient. It, it really helps other people help you, helps other people evaluate you. So who are the tar who's the target audience for a business plan? And the first one is you. You are your audience. And I'll tell you why. Um, even if, even if nobody asked you for a business plan, I, as an advisor would, would, if you had an idea, I would ask you to do some foundational work to start to build up towards a business plan. Because when you do, I will guarantee you, it will look a lot different when your thoughts are put on paper. Um, and there's a, I, I heard at a conference, uh, the other day, somebody else said it, and I'm good for repeating thing, good things other people say, but, you know, um, writing is the universe's way of showing you how sloppy your thinking is. And that's not you, it's not me, it's, it's all of us, right? So it enables a higher level of thinking and therefore more focused action if, you, if you're writing. It helps you organize your goals, your priorities, helps you organize your intentions. Again, uncovers void in thoughts and addresses subjects possibly overlooked. You may think you've thought of everything until you see a template and you realize, oh boy, there's some other areas here I need to, um, I need to fill in. Um, the other thing it is, it does for an entrepreneur, it encourages some daily progress, keeps you motivated. You can actually see something being created, um, which can be motivating. And when you're done, you will, you will feel like you've made substantial progress. And um, there's nobody that I've, I've, coached or advised that um, has gone through this process and come out the other side and didn't say, boy, Lou, I, you know, that was really tough, but it was a really good idea to start. So let's talk about other stakeholders. And this is really the majority of, you know, my engagement interaction comes from um, clients who have been asked by others to provide a business plan. And on the, on the top, uh, top row here, um, I've got some, some documentation that uh, typically go along with um, the entrepreneurial journey. On the left, I've got some stakeholders. And so let's talk about each of these stakeholders and, and what they require. So if you're going to a bank, um, and you're probably not a startup at this point, but maybe you are, but maybe you're an existing business. What they're gonna ask you for is um, your financial history, they're gonna ask you for a financial forecast. They're gonna ask you to fill out a, a loan application and they're gonna ask you for a business plan. And um, this is pretty much non-negotiable. I mean, if you wanna be considered for a loan, you, um, you need to have these particular items um, available to the, to the banker. Now, let's say you're a little earlier and you're going to talk to investors you need some early stage capital. What, what's an investor gonna look like? And I'll, I'll talk about it from the perspective of maybe an individual investor or maybe a um, more of a professional uh, investor organization such as an angel group. So um, typically to get, them, to get them interested, you'll, you'll have provided a one page overview um, and then potentially a pitch deck, you know, on the, on the front end of, of the work. And then they'll ask you for, to fill out an application. And they'll ask you, and that's an application typically is if it's a more of a professional angel, organized angel group. Of course, if it's an individual investor, they won't have an application. But what they're going to ask you for is, all right, send me your business plan, and that will include a financial forecast. So, um, again, business plan is, is important um, for, for investors. Now, let's say you were going to reach out to 
uh, maybe a strategic partner, maybe there's um, a marketing relationship or a, a product, uh, the manufacturing relationship that you're going to um, engage in. And maybe it's a strategic partnership. Maybe it's, you know, you're going to invest some resources. They're going to invest some resources to work together. Well, how do they know, how would they know that um, your, your goals are aligned? So typically what a, you know, for a partner engagement strategic relationship, you'll want to provide a pitch deck, which talks about your business and your idea, and then, and then a business plan. Um, on the other side, also, if you're evaluating a strategic partner, and you're going to invest some resources in a venture or in an activity, you'll probably want a business plan for them to, to see, um, to, to assure yourself that this, um, this particular partner um, kind of knows what they're doing. So also key hires, um, strategic hires in your management team. And it really, I mean, I've seen um, organizations use it with their, with their rank and file employees, right? Um, try to get buy-in. Um, for a key for a key hire, uh, a lot of times they'll they'll ask you for if they could see a business plan, or on the other hand, you'll provide them with a business plan so they know what they're getting themselves into. Um, and of course, that would probably be done under a non-disclosure agreement at some point. Um, so, if you were um, maybe applying to an incubator um, or an accelerator program, typically they'll ask you for an application, but also um, they, they might ask you for a business plan um, as part of the uh, admissions process to evaluate um, your company, where you are, where you're going, if it's a good fit for that particular incubator or accelerator. And the same thing goes with competitions. There are competitions. Um, uh, you'll find them in the Valley. You'll find them nationwide. Um, but they'll, they'll ask you for an application. But they'll also ask you probably for a pitch deck and a business plan or some form of a business plan in, in maybe their format. Um, and then finally advisors. So anybody that you're going to work with either on a formal or informal basis and I, you know, as an SBDC advisor, um, there's nothing better, nothing, it, nothing is, makes it easier to work with a client than if they walk in with a business plan or some foundational work that resembles a business plan. Because again, it, it jump starts the conversation. It's something that advisors can read in advance um, and be prepared to have really productive conversations with you um, right from the beginning. Um, if you provide a, uh, an advisor a business plan um, and you get in uh, and you start to work with that advisor, if they, if, if they haven't read the business plan, you'll know. But if, you, if they had read the business plan, you'll know also. Okay, so what are the key elements of a good business plan? And this, and in this um, uh, workshop, I'm not going to, this is not a tutorial on how to write a business plan or what, um, and what the template should look like and what the certain, what the elements should be, because they really differ depending on your business, depending on your stage. Um, you know, if you're an early stage company, there's gonna be more, um, more projections and more um, discovery in the business plan. If you're uh, you know, existing company, you're looking for a line of credit or you're looking to buy a building or an expansion loan, the business plan is gonna look a little different, right? It's going to um, have more about your existing business, your existing strategy, and then the incremental pieces on, on what's different now um, as, you, as you move forward with maybe a new source of capital. So um, just a business plan, it's not a novel. I think I, I said that it's on 50 pages, but it's not a single page document. You know, it's anywhere from a five to a 15 page document. And on the 15 pages, it sounds like a lot, but I guarantee you when you start to write it and you start to address all the different areas, um, you, you'll be actually hard pressed sometimes to fit it into 15 pages. You know, on the five page side, it's maybe that's more of an existing business um, looking for some expansion capital and things are a little bit more concrete. Um, it's not an operational plan tied to resources and schedule. So a lot of people get paralyzed because they think they've got to have everything planned out and all the, all the dates and resources assigned and how we're going to get it done. It's not a, not a construction schedule. It's a blueprint. Um, and so some of you have gone through, um, the lean startup, um, process and uh, maybe develop the Lean Canvas. Now, a Lean Canvas is a great foundational tool. I'm a big believer in it. But however, when someone asks you for a business plan, do not give them the Lean Canvas. That's not a business plan. 
it's a, that's a foundational framework for you to start to write a business plan, but it's not a substitute. And it will be outdated by the, uh, by the time the ink is dry now. Okay, it's a term that we don't use very much, but by the time you're finished writing it, um, it's going to be outdated and that's okay. It's a living document um, that needs to be updated on a, on a semi-regular basis or a regular basis. But even if you come, you know, if you come into a, you know, um, an investor or let's say a bank, um, you can say, hey, this is about 80% accurate. There's some other things I need to add. It may give you an opportunity to update it the investor may say, hey, let's just talk about what the changes are, what's different. But you're, you're by having put it down, um, you're in a much better situation. And the other thing I'll just say is um, follow the template formatting. So one thing about a business plan is it needs to be written well, but it also needs to be organized. And there'll be template formats that will be available to you, but follow them. And what I mean is, you know, the capitalization, the section breaks, um, the, the, uh, uh, the different font sizes, make sure it's consistent as you work through because the, the, you know, what you want to be able to do as a reader is read it. And if I start reading it and I can't in my mind keep it organized um, and it's because of the, the, just the template formatting, um, that kind of works against you. So just follow the template formatting. Now let's talk about some specific elements of a good business plan. So I'm gonna start with the executive summary, okay? Um, I'm starting with this because it's probably the most important piece of it. However, it's the part, I will say it is probably what you would write last. So um, it's after you've written your business plan and you've worked with maybe some outside advisors to help you crisp it up and, and, and condense it into, into actionable or, or uh, crisp points, then you'll draw out the important points and put it into an executive summary. And it's usually one page, maybe two, not more than two, same font as your business plan. Um, don't try to shrink it down to eight point font just to get as much as you can on the page because that's not what they're asking for. Um, and I will tell you in, in many situations, um, this could be the only thing that that's read. Um, and a lot of times, you know, if you can't get through the business, if you can't get through the executive summary and understand what the business is really about, um, I'm probably, the, or me or a stakeholder is probably not going to turn the page to start to write, to read the entire business plan, because now you're making it really hard on me. So, um, and, and a lot of times also, I, you know, we'll look at the executive summary, and then if it's a good executive summary, we'll kind of understand it. And then we'll start thumbing through the business plan and look for consistencies. And that's usually a red flag if there's inconsistencies. If you know, you're talking about if you have market data in the business plan that doesn't match the executive summary or, um, or projections that don't match, then that becomes a red flag that, um, okay, there's some consistency issues here. So um, make it simple, you make it digestible. Um, it's a little bit of an art, but um, if you go through the process, it, it actually, um, it actually is a lot easier than you might think. So, all right, let's um, let's talk about the next uh, the next piece, and that's uh, um, the value proposition. So, the value proposition um, communicates the clearest benefit that customers receive by giving you the business, right? So, any anybody who's written a value proposition knows it can be very difficult to do, and takes a little bit of work but really it's what you can deliver in value that your competition can't in a very succinct way. What is the problem being solved? What is the pain point and how are you different? Um, and this is something that people will, will look to, to see if it resonates as a, as something that they believe to be true. Um, it, it's, it's a, as I said, it can be a very difficult thing to do at first, but with some work and some iterations and some outside help, um, it's usually um, something that most people can do pretty readily. Um, if you can't write a value proposition, you can't come up with a good crisp value proposition, that's usually, again, a red flag that maybe there isn't value there. Um, so it's important. It's an important piece of the business plan. 
um, you, you'll have to have a section in there on the market and the market overview. Uh, you'll have to describe the overall market. What's the, what is it in, in terms of units or dollars, preferably dollars? How big is it? Is it growing? Is it mature? Is it stable? What's the growth rate? We like to talk about CAGR, compound ag annual growth rate. What is that? Um, what's the market outlook, long-term and short-term? What, short what are the dynamics? So if you look to the left, you'll see uh, just an example of um, maybe a market slide or a, a, a piece if that may go into business plan. And it talks about a market size of $5.7 billion in 2020. And in 2025, it, it's growing to $12.2 billion. And the CAGR is 21%, which means the year over year annual growth is 21%. So if you're in a especially early stage business, that you're looking um, for maybe some investment. Investors will look at two things. What is the size of the market and is it growing? Um, if it's a big market and growing, that's great. If it's a small market and growing, that's okay. If it's a big market that's not growing as fast, well, maybe if it's a small market that's not growing, well, that's a problem. Um, the other thing is specify your sources of secondary, da of secondary data. So typically um, this re these, um, the market numbers, the physical numbers will come from a third party report. And uh, I'll talk to you a little bit at the end, but we, you know, we at the SBDC have some opportunity to provide some no fee market research that um, many, many of my clients use as the basis for their business plan. But you know, I will caution you on this side. Um, you, can do, you can do internet searches and you can pull out a lot of market data and it could be disparate. It could be all over the, you know, not connected per se. And a lot of folks will, in their business plan, decide just to fill it with market data because they, they think, well, if I just put a lot of market data in here, um, people will think I know um, what, I'm, what I'm doing or what I'm talking about. And it becomes kind of fill, kind of fill work. And uh, that's not really what we want to do. We want to be able to describe it succinctly. You want to keep the numbers consistently. Um, and again, specify the secondary data. Now, there is maybe an opportunity to do a bottoms up approach and, and, and maybe if you could uh, segment it down to a small space, you could count the number of businesses, you can estimate the number of reven the revenue, maybe the average revenue um, per year for that particular business, and maybe come up with a bottoms up approach for, uh, for your market data. And that's good too. Um, and, and, you know, I would I definitely would prefer the secondary data, but if there's some bottoms up, I would, I would add it to the secondary data. I wouldn't do a straight bottoms up analysis um, per se. I would always try to have some secondary data that's validated by, um, by a specific source in there. And then the other thing on doing the bottoms up is a lot of folks will do, uh, will really create very complex models for the bottoms up market to get to the market size. And then whenever you see a market um, size estimate that's out to three or four decimal places, you know that that particular individual has probably done it himself. Um, you, um, you know, more than one decimal place typically um, is, is not necessary for, for market estimate numbers. Okay, move on. Customer segments. Who are your customers? Um, there's a lot of work here that can be done and, and it's, it'd be hard to convince a stakeholder that you understand your business unless you understand your customers, who they are, um, and not only who they are, the uh, demographics, um, age, gender, income, geography, where do they live, where do they work, their psychographic personality traits, there's behavioral traits, spending, consumption, usage. I had a client I was working with um, on a very interesting concept with regard to energy, and they said, you know, and they, and, and they were required to, they were going for a grant and, and had to write a business plan. And uh, they, in their customer segment section, they said, well, you know, our client is very, our, our target customer is very similar to of those um, customers that buy a Tesla. And they kind of moved on from that. And so, you know, that's important. And I thought that was really good, but I was, but I, all I could think about, there's a lot more to describe your customer than just buying a Tesla. There's a lot of things with regard to um, psychographics and behavior that you can, you can, you could have a rich um, understanding of that particular customer. 
I like customer personas, and this is kind of the the extreme, but um, you'll 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 see, um, and I, I see from time to time people who come in who've actually created customer personas. So actually, who is this customer? And give them a picture and and and, and an age and and list. And you can't read this here, and neither can I. But you list their demographics and their psychographics, and this is good to include in your business plan. It's good to share with your team. Um, you might have two or three different personas that you, you create, and these are your targets. These are the people that you believe are going to be your customers. Um, yeah, so customer segments are really very important in understanding who they are. Okay, another, another um, piece of the business plan is the competition. Um, again, if you have, you come in and you're engaging with others and stakeholders, especially stakeholders who have done this for a while, and you claim that you have no competition, that's a red flag, okay? Um, you always have competition. It may be not direct competition, but you always do have competition and, and you have an obligation uh, to really think through how the competition is going to affect your business. So. In the competition section, you want to list your key companies that compete with you. You can list products or services that compete with you. Um, do they compete across the board or just specific products, certain customers or in certain geographic areas? You know, these, these matrices with features and, and different parameters work well here. I just pulled something out off the internet just to give to describe it. But again, like the, like the uh, market section, there's a tendency to kind of overdo it a little bit um, because typically there's a lot of competitive information. So again, if I can cut and paste a lot of information into my document, it may be people will think that I really understand my competition, but the fact is that really you should be able to describe your competition in a page or two and the salient points behind why they are your competition. So again, very important that you know your competition um, don't ever say you don't have any competition um, and, and do the work to make sure you've really done the analysis on who that competition is and how it really affects your business and, and your business moving forward. Okay, we talked about the jockey and the horse in the beginning. Okay, this is the the, uh, the, the, night, the slide that kind of goes with that. So management team and advisors. So um, again, people, stakeholders, they invest, they lend, they work with people that they can trust and understand um, and who have um, an understanding behind their own business. So here, your management team, you can provide your brief biographies of who they are. They don't have to, you know, don't take a page per person. It's, you know, it's a quarter page. It's a pair, a couple paragraphs maybe at the most for the founders and maybe your key management team, some others, but summarize their experience, your experience, and those of your key employees. Focus on the prior experience and skills that have prepared your team to succeed in this business. So if you've got domain expertise, if it's a restaurant and you've been in the restaurant business, talk about that. If the person doesn't have domain expertise, maybe has um, uh, expertise in, in uh, I shouldn't say domain expertise, industry expertise. If they have domain expertise and maybe marketing or, um, or maybe they're your CFO, they're fine, they have a strong financial background, you know, put, put that in there. Um, if you've had any experience, especially if you're early on uh, with startups, failures are okay here, right? I mean, most, most entrepreneurs don't get it on the first try. So, you know, what, what have you done? Now, if you've had some successes, that's even better on the startup side. So if you had some, some uh, exits or some businesses that you've been built up into profitable enterprises, that's important to, um, to, uh, to um, list. Um, but then, so that's your management team. And you know, some entrepreneurs, if you're early, it's one, it's two, it's three, you know, it's one guy or one gal and a, and a co-founder and maybe a couple others that are working part-time. Um, the other really important piece is who are your advisors? So list the members of your advisory support team. Okay, so I'm assuming you've got an advisory support team. So if you don't, 
have an advisory support team, that tells me you don't, you might not understand what you don't know and might not understand that typically uh, an, uh, an entrepreneurial startup team per se doesn't have all the skills it needs. So um, it, it, you, you really need to make an effort to reach out to the community um, and provide and get some um, advisory support. It doesn't have to be formal. As a matter of fact, I would advise that it not be formal. Anybody who's asking you to advise for half percent on your cap table, um, you got to be careful. There are others, you'd be surprised if you reached out and you networked um, into, especially this uh, particular ecosystem, there's plenty of folks out there that um, will will help you just because um, they want to be part of, of your success and they want to uh, they want to be able to participate. Um, as an SBDC advisor, we we can play a um, we we can be one of your advisors here, and and um, and I always encourage my um, my clients to go out and get multiple advisors, especially if they come to me, and they may like what I'm saying and they may like um, what I'm telling them. Um, I, I always advise, look, I know some things. There are plenty of other people in this ecosystem that know things that I don't. Go out and find those people. We may give you contradictory advice at times, but that's up to you to be able to filter that out. Um, so go get some advisors. If you've got a good advisory support team and you list that and, and, and as part of your key management, that goes a long way in, in stakeholders knowing that you are, um, you're coachable. Um, okay, so risks. So I, on the left here, I've got a, some dice with manage your risk. So first, you've got to identify risk. And again, another red flag, no risk. There's no risk here. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. So if you've done this enough, um, you know, if somebody tells you that there's no risk in their venture, uh, they're either uninformed or, or they're in denial. Now, I will tell you, um, again, where you are in the spectrum, if you're a later stage business and you're going for a, um, you know, a line of credit or you're going to want to buy a building to expand um, or, again, some working capital because maybe you want to produce a new product, um, you know, your risk profile is going to be different, right? And you're going to be at a bank, probably, and a bank is going to, you know, is the different risk profile than than early stage capital. So, uh, but you still have some risk. And but if you're earlier, especially if you know you're a startup, um, you need to uh, identify the risks. And as as stakeholders who are educated, we know there's risk. There's always risk. There's no getting around it. Um, Either you tell me what the risk is, or I'll try to, I'll try to, I will um, be able to pull it out of you if I put the effort in. Um, and, and if I sense that you're reluctant to talking about risk, then again, that's a red flag as to um, why would I might want to invest my resources or my time in, in working with you. So um, be transparent about your risk. Uh, and when we talk about risk, it's not necessarily, you know, hey, we're going to have another pandemic or we're going to have an earthquake or, or anything like that, right? There's millions of things that could happen, but it's risks that are, you know, that are kind of germane to your business. Uh, you know, I'll give an example of I had a client who had manufacturing business and we were talking about it and um, it came up that she's got, you know, it's a supply chain. Her supply chain is really an individual manufacturer in in a, in a state he's an older fella he owns the tooling so now it's really reliant on this one specialized manufacturer um and you know that that's that's something that you're that may not even um, seem like a risk to you but that's that's important to be able to 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 tell um, um some of your stakeholders um your business is a much about managing risk right so if you think about management what is, if you don't know the risk is there you can't manage it um, so as a manager, you, you, you try to look at your risks, look at that uncertainty on a daily, on a monthly, on a yearly basis, and do what you can to mitigate those risks, to minimize those risks while ma maximizing your upside. And then I'll just, the last piece on this is um, you have an obligation to disclose, especially if you are looking for early stage capital. So um, you don't have to write a you know, like a private, a legal document, a private placement memorandum, that those you really don't need to. 
uh, there's typically investors will go through due diligence process. During the due diligence process, you really have a legal obligation to disclose. I'll leave the rest of that for the lawyers, um, but you you can't hide risk from um, from investors. Okay, I think this is the last uh, slide for the element elements of a good business plan. So, and then here's, here's something that, you know, many of my clients, they cringe because they're good at their business and they, and they really they understand their business, but, but they don't really understand the financials. And so we, we, we work with a lot of clients and helping with, with, uh, with uh, financial education. So um, in the financials, there's three really important pieces. There's the profit and loss statement. There's the cash flow statement. There's the balance sheet. Okay, profit and loss is your um, is your income statement essentially. Your cash flow is really your checkbook, and your balance sheet are your assets and liabilities. Um, if you're going to a, a bank for a loan, per se, you're going to need at least two years of history, maybe the last year by month, prior years by year, and advice. Make sure it matches your taxes because we don't want to, you know, we don't want to have two sets of books. Um, and then there's projections, right? So typically three years, let's say for a banker, maybe um, two years by month and then three years, the year three by the year. Um, in, in, uh, for an investor, you probably want to you know, project out five years, especially if you've got no history, if you're early stage. Um, and you know, on projections, this is something that uh, folks really get kind of stuck on and they don't want to lie. They don't want to be wrong. And, and pro, you know, by definition, projections are, they're wrong. They're a guess, they're a best guess. But as long as you've got good rationale and good basis for your thoughts, that's really the most important thing about the projections um, is, the, is the basis for the foundation of, of where they come from. Um, then, then you're usually in pretty good shape. Um, we know, you know, we know that if you can operate Excel, you can make the numbers look like whatever they want on the projection. So um, you can make them look too high, you can make them look too low. Um, but again, the rationale and the thought behind the projections are the most important thing for somebody evaluating your, your uh, particular business. It also, um, you know, beyond evaluation, it's, you know, for yourself, we go back to who is this for, for yourself, you know, having projections for your business, um, even if you're a coffee shop, even if you're a pizza joint, you know, um, you should be able to project out your, your next year or two and then track, track to those uh, projections. And then, you know, you know you've, you're in business, you should understand your business. And if you don't meet your projections, why? Understand why. And then if you are, you know, if you're exceeding your projections, you want to understand why also. But they give you a baseline, they give you a target. Okay, I think we're getting towards the end here. Um, let's see. Let's talk about resources. So here I'm just talking about business plans in general. Um, you know, Robert provided a whole host of resources that the ACA provides and links to community partners. There's lots out there. But with regard to, I'm just gonna give you some targeted um, um, resources with regard to business plans. And again, I'll plug the SBDC and as SBD advisor, We'll work with you, provide you a template, provide you some foundational tools to get you um, to the point where you can write a business plan. And they'll give you that one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, uh, advising service that you may need as you get into the business planning process. Um, that we, we, I have templates. We have templates that we work with. We all have templates that we like, starting points, um, and that could be provided to you. There's uh, another an, another volunteer organization called SCORE. Some of you have heard of it. If not, just Google SCORE. Um, they've got some terrific templates on their website. They're also funded by the SBA, but they're still a volunteer organization. Again, you can pull down templates. There is a piece of software um, that's out there called LivePlan. In um, what LivePlan does, it's it's a software package that will will actually create a business plan for you integrated with some financials, but it does it in a very friendly um, interface. And so if you, you know, it, it really is kind of like the TurboTax of business plans. It asks you questions and prompts you and you provide information into that, into that piece of software. 
um, and it will at the back end spit out a, a you know, what lo looks like a pretty good business plan. Um, you can, um, you can sign up yourself. I think it's $10 a month to get started. Um, there's some yearly plans, but the good thing is uh, real recently, the SBDC has a bunch of uh, uh, licenses for life plan for our clients. So if you come into an SBDC counselor and you want to go down that path, um, we can provide you with a life plan um, account and you can get started at no cost um, with some advisory services on top of it, which is nice. Um, the other thing is the, uh, the SBA. Yeah, if you go to the SBA's website, they've got um, really some nice resources on, on how to write a business plan with some templates. You also could ask your, um, your audience. You know, if you're, if you're working with an investor group, say, do you have a template that you like to use? Um, you know, if you're working with a, an incubator, maybe they've got a template. I know like um, if we're working with uh, going uh, uh, SBIR grants, you know, and there's commercialization sections, the, the, the government or the, the granting agency will tell you what they want in their commercialization plan, their business plan. They give, they'll give you an outline. And so you can work to that. It turns out that once you write a business plan, um, you've got a lot of the elements you'll need to cut and paste into different formats. So it becomes kind of a repository. You go back to that plan um, for, the, or the, for the particular items you might need for different um, audiences. And then, you know, last and, you know, not least, but you can do an internet search. There's tons of information on business plans out there. Um, you know, it, it's probably the least efficient way to go, but it, there's, there's, there's tons of templates. Uh, most important thing is that you can get started and that you can get some help in, in, in working your way through it. Okay, so as an SBDC counselor, um, and, and a representative of our organizations, we, I want you to know that you are, um, you're eligible for counseling. Um, and you'll get these slides afterwards, but this is our address our, uh, at our website. And then there's a button request for counseling. You put in your, your information. And then within a um, couple days, a counselor or somebody will contact you. Um, if you're early, you know, if you're really early stage and you haven't, um, gone through some of the foundational work, we may divert you to an initial session. Um, we used to have a class on, on kind of some of the foundational work. I think we're moving to an online uh, uh, service that, that you, can, you can complete on your own. And then you, you'll, you'll be set up with a counselor. If you're a little farther along, they may uh, pair you with a counselor right off the bat. Um, but again, it's important that you have some of that foundational work done before you you come and uh, see a counselor. Uh, I don't control who gets assigned. You know, we have, um, boy, I, I think we're up to 16 or 17 counselors now here in Maricopa County. Um, I, don't, I don't do the assignments, but um, you can, you know, if you think you like my, web, uh, my webinar and you wanna request me, you can do that, or you can contact me directly. Here's, here's, my, uh, here's my contact information. So, um, that's it for today. I want to thank you all for, for bearing with me. Um, hopefully this was uh, informative and enjoyable. And um, at the SBDC, we look forward to working with you guys as you need it. So I think I'll turn it back over to Bob. All right, awesome. Thanks, Lou. Appreciate uh, the presentation. Great information. We have a couple of questions that have popped up. Okay. Um, one was just asking about the SBDCs in general. So let everybody know that the SBDCs are located throughout the state. Every county has access to an SBDC um, that corresponds uh, with your geographic region. Um, so if you live outside of Maricopa County, uh, feel free to message me or you can go to azsbdc.net and find the, uh, the state homepage and get directed to the right uh, SBDC office. Um, also, we had a, in the chat bar, we had a question um, with a company uh, that had been involved, had applied to the Arizona Innovation Challenge and could use some help on, on the, sounds like could use some help on their business plan uh, for that program. And Lou, is that something that the SBDC can help with? Absolutely. I, um, 
I have me and a couple of my colleagues, we, we help um, the clients through the AIC process all the time. So yeah, we're, we're real familiar with it. And, and, if, and I believe you have some clients that have actually won the AIC. Is that correct? Um, collectively. Yeah, we have, we have. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. Uh, so that's, that's a great resource there. Uh, if you have any questions for Lou, we got uh, just a couple minutes. We could we'd answer one more or two more. Um, throw those in the uh, Q and A box on the bottom of the screen. Uh, another question, Lou, that popped up uh, when you were talking about personas, creating a persona. Um, it says, "What if you're a B two B, a business to business company? Um, will you create a persona based on the buyer title role?" Well, no, that's a good point, and actually, I overlooked that uh, point when I was was talking. Um, you know, you want to you want to be able to describe the the industry and the and the companies that buy <clears throat> your product if you're B two B. But <clears throat> remember that um, uh, companies don't buy anything; people buy. People still buy. So um, think about who your decision makers are in that particular company and who you know what might motivate them, and you can create some personas in addition to the company profiles. Okay. Excellent. And we had a, one more question pop up. Actually, we had two pop in. First one is, does the SBDC have any market research on charitable service support, non-financial from small businesses? Oh, I'm not sure I understand that one. Um, we have market research services, but I'm not sure about charitable support. I don't, yeah, I'm not, could you clarify? Um, that was just a question. Okay. Um, I believe you may not have that because a lot of charitable service may be kept quiet, you know, maybe kept private by those businesses. So right. unless they report it in some way, it'd be hard to, to track. Um, we got one more question before we have to wrap up. Um, can the executive summary be the one page overview you mentioned that are needed for investors? What is the difference? Okay, that's a, that's a really uh, insightful question. So it can be, but you know, I like to use and investors like to see a different format than the, the executive summary. So if you have nothing else but the executive summary, that's always good. But there's a one pager that we use that actually um, talks about some of the elements that are in your executive summary, but then visually um, kind of stacks up your investment, your management team, and um, that looks a little bit different and, and they really like it. Um, so again, you can get back to me. I can provide you some examples of what that one page overview might look like. Okay, excellent. Well, we are right on time. Um, Lou, I wanna thank you for your time and uh, expertise on this topic. Uh, business planning is extremely important and I, uh, I've found that it's always a great tool to help to, to keep, like you mentioned, it's a live document, keep updating it, keep referring to it. So I, I appreciate you sharing this information with everybody. Um, as a reminder, we have our next session is Thursday morning, 9 a.m. Uh, go to the website, register for it if you have not. But until then, uh, everybody have a great day. Um, again, thank you, Lou, and we will see everybody on Thursday. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks.